Welcome to Word, Chapter 2, Creating a Research Paper with References and Sources. This is page WD, I believe, 6-5 in your textbook. Shows you the list of objectives that we have for this paper, the things we're going to go through. Page 66, the next page over, shows us the roadmap. Actually, 66 does not. 66 talks about what's going on here. 67 shows us the three-page paper we are going to end up with. Please do not type it from this picture. There are differences that you will miss as you go along and reasons for them uh, that they're doing you, that uh, can confuse you in the end. So we don't want to miss out on the details of how to put this together. If you're here in the classroom or here at school, I do have files for you on the H drive that under the Mrs. Talsma folder that you can um, access to help you move along with typing like we're going to do in the classroom. So... Uh, but on your lab assignment, you get to type the whole thing. And I'll tell you right now here and up front, proofread, proofread, proofread. Get together with a partner and proofread. Historically, this lab assignment that you're about to do this week has the lowest score on it due to proofreading. Students understand the concepts of what they're doing in Word to make it look like this, but then they miss um, out in the proofreading aspect. So you're going to want to make sure you proofread. So... We're going to follow these pages to complete that. Page 67. No, no, sorry, page 68. I can't even keep my number straight yet. Roadmap. This is the part I enjoy about this book. It's a roadmap for how they recommend you put a research paper together. Number one, change your document settings. Set it all up so that you can see you're prepared. Everything you type just fits in the right spot. Number two, create the header that you need to go on. And we are dealing with an MLA style paper as shown down here in the bottom. So we're going to deal it specifically. Who's done an MLA style paper before? Who's done an APA? Who's done both? A few of us have done both. So what we're doing, hoping here at school is to help you learn both so that as you get to your four-year univers universities and colleges, you're prepared for whichever one they require you to do. So the header is different, APA versus MLA. Third, we're going to actually type it, and we're going to include citations as we go. Four, we're going to create a works cited page. That's the source page, what it's called in the MLA style, works cited. And at the end, we will proofread and revise our entire paper. So let's get going and set up what's going to be needed to make our... Um, paper fit the right way. And there are tools we can use. Many of us would probably select our text or just start typing and change things around, but we're going to look at changing some stuff that will stay changed as we go forward. And you'll want to know about it. And I will be able to tell what method you use based on how your paper looks. Because often there's a spot that's missed when it's time to change fonts. So if you haven't already, launch a word, blank Word document. First thing we want to do in your textbook, it recommends you work with your show hides turned on so you can see where formatting is going. I'm going to have them on because I'm used to them. For you personally, you may use them on or off, whatever you're comfortable with, but remember we're learning to learn when it's appropriate to turn them on so you can figure out what's going on. So troubleshooting, you want to make sure that you turn them on. First thing we're going to do is modify the style. What do we know about the default font and set up of our characters right now. Calibri, what size is it? 11. What do you know about line spacing? It used to be 1.15 after it used to be 1, and now it's down to 1.08. How much space is between paragraphs? It's like 0.08, I believe it is, and we'll review this as we go forward. My point in bringing this up is an MLA-style paper did not adjust its formatting to accommodate the changes that Microsoft Word thought were cool or appropriate. So the MLA-style paper still requires uh, left, right, top, bottom margins of one inch. Thankfully, we have that as a default. We aren't going to have to worry about changing that one. But it also still requires double spacing. 
no lines, no changes between it. I'm sorry, no extra spaces between paragraphs, first lines indented, all sorts of things like that. We can set that up right now in a fell swoop, one fell swoop, so that we won't have to change it on every paragraph. We won't have to remember to do that. Let's look at our styles grouping on our home tab and right click normal. When you make changes to these styles up there, it affects only this document. So even though every document is by default has normal style uh, set up and running, operating, it's on. And no matter what you do now, it's not going to affect any document you've already created. It's not going to affect any future documents, especially if you don't click a certain button. We want to modify it. In the font, the formatting group, the font, we need to change that to Times New Roman. The size gets changed to 12. Here's the thing. Down here at the bottom, you see where it says only this document, and you see the button that says new documents based on this? Make sure you don't click that. Keep the radio dial on only this document. That's the key to making certain that you don't affect any document you're going to do going forward. And then we click OK. Same thing with line spacing. Let's set our line spacing right now to be 2.0. Let's click this same line spacing button. It is in the paragraph group on the home tab. It's a button with the arrows pointing up and down. Same thing here. Let's use the command to remove space after paragraph. So no matter what it was, we don't need it anymore. Nothing changed on our screen simply because that wasn't something that would have moved. We wouldn't see the space until we pressed enter the next time. Now that we've made those changes, we think to ourselves, how many of you thought to yourselves, well, why didn't we do that when we were modifying the style? If you want the whole document to be like that. Great question. Turns out we're showing you the multiple ways that you can do things. So. I'm showing you right now that you can actually do formatting in your document. Now right click normal style and sit, click the top command that says update normal to match selection. And if you're concerned about it, you can go back and select the paragraph and then do it. And okay. So you can update your styles several different ways. You can actually modify them or you can choose something you like and um, update a style to match that. First area of the document we're going to look at is the header. An MLA style header includes the last name and the page number at the right margin. So you've got several ways to do this. I'm going to show you what I personally think is the shortest shortcut to doing it, but you may have a different way and that's going to be okay as long as we end up with the same information. I am, my white space above my margin is visible. I'm going to double click in here and that automatically takes me into the header and it's a blank header. So I said that everything no, needs to be at the right edge. I have, a control, I have a keyboard shortcut that takes me to the right edge. Anybody remember what it is? Control R. R. Control R takes me right over to the right margin. Now my paragraph is right aligned. That's the same thing, absolutely. It's the same thing on the home tab as moving to the home tab and clicking this right align button. Um, but if I clicked on the home tab, it would have taken me out of this ribbon tab and I would have to re-click it because I actually want to be here. So my, th my theory is if my hand's on the keyboard, I don't want to take it off. If my hand's already on the mouse, I'll use stuff with the mouse. But your, you know your keys, you always get, your fingers you always get them on the right keys, so I try not to move them out. Um, the MLA style header takes the last name. 
and in this case we're going to use Bailey. I am going to encourage you to use the word Bailey if you were already on Blackboard you would have seen that their assignment is open with instructions. We want to we want we're going to end up taking three screen prints as we go along. When we get entirely done, we will change the name on the first line of the header to ours. We want to wait until we match all the word count and all the information that's in here. Then we will make this change. Um, we're also going to practice a technique you're going to see on your upcoming application test. So those of you working ahead, don't forget to do this. Page 86 is your first one. So for right now, we're using the name that's in the textbook, and that is Bailey. We press the space bar once because we don't want things run together. Now we need the page number. Several ways to get your page numbers. Here's the way that I'm choosing to go do it. My design tab for header and footer tools automatically popped up, populated into the ribbon when I double clicked into the heading area. So on the left hand side is a grouping called header and footer. And I'm going to the page number tab. There's a lot of options. Current position is what I want. Current position and I just need a plain number. I don't need any of this other cool stuff to go along with it. Here's what you want to know about it. When you move your cursor onto it or you select it, it's a shaded gray. That's because it's a code, also known as a field, that Microsoft is putting in so that as we have additional pages, it will automatically number the pages 1, 2, 3, 4. Back in the day, the typist day, we had to number them ourselves. No more. Thank you, word processing. Woo! We like it. We'll keep that going. You're going to love it for all the papers that you have to go. Now that you have had struggled with some of the stuff you're doing, you can see this and going, wow. Oh, you'll have more. Other classes will require them, not just your English classes. Uh, case in point, my philosophy is we don't recre recreate the wheel. So I'm telling you, if you have, if you have a, something in MLA style, um, after you get done with this assignment in this class, I would save it to MLA template, MLA style template, and maybe delete out the actual text, but leave things like the works cited and all these other formats that are specific. And then every time that you have to write an MLA style paper, you would open this up, save it to a new name, and just go. Would be my recommendation for it. So anyways, this is, um, that's why I find some of the easiest ways to insert page number. There's lots of different ways you could have done it already. When you're done with the header, a couple different ways to get out of it. On the design tab of the header and footer tools up on the ribbon, you could click close header. You can also double click back in your document. We are not focusing on drafting the actual research paper, so I will skip that portion on page 78. But I can tell you these four lines of information that we're about to enter in, shown on the bottom of page 78, are in every MLA paper. It goes like this. Name of the author. Press the enter. The K went. Whoever requested this. And in your case, it's usually an instructor. Why they requested it. In, in this student's case, it was English 101. And the date that they wrote it or submitted it. Those four pieces of information, mark them, they're going to be on your test, they're going to be on your quiz, all sorts of stuff. Need them. What goes up in the header? Tell me. Last name and page number. I'm confident that's on your quiz. Page 79. Oh, Ted, I can't do that. Thank you for keeping me on track. We'll spell his name correctly. Thank you for red, wave, red wavy lines, too. Next thing I want to show you, if you, how many of you already use the concept of click and type? How many of you have used it accidentally? Me. Uh -huh. Click and type is exactly what it says. Move your cursor to where you want to go. Click twice. Double click. 
and your cursor will move over. So example, if I wanted to go halfway down my page, I would just double click down here, bam, it would move all, put all these returns into it and then a tab over to where I was at. I don't want to do that. This time, I actually want to, um, I want to go more, I want to center this paragraph. Instead of using my keyboard shortcut of control E, my hand's already on my mouse, so I'm just going to double click over here, center the paper. I don't get a tab. Microsoft Word intuitively figured out I want to center this one instead of tabbing. So it changed my actual paragraph alignment to center. Same thing with right. So that's another way that you can change your paragraph alignment. Page 80. Table 2-1, Table 2-2, keyboard shortcuts. I think we discussed that these are applications, and so I wouldn't ask these on a quiz, but they are still very handy to know. I believe if you, it used to be if you went into the word search, you could uh, do keyboard shortcuts and get a whole entire list. So if you ever need them, they are there in the help system. You don't have to miss them. And we're supposed to type our title in here, access granted. And press enter because we are ready to go. Let's save this document because you know we don't want to lose anything. Save it to wherever you're saving all your files. I'm doing a brilliant naming convention, W2, what is this, um, paper. Your textbook gives you, recommends a name for it. I don't care what you name it as long as you can file it when you up, find it when you upload it to Blackboard. And if I have any issues, you can get that back. I now want to see the rulers and they aren't visible so I'm going to the view tab and I'm clicking the button under the show grouping that says ruler. You're going to want this turned on because we're going to use them. One thing you notice we already talked about when you have a paragraph alignment and you press enter that same paragraph alignment moves forward, right? So that moved us over to our new line is center alignment. I'm going to hit my backspace key because I want to be back to left alignment. Every paragraph for the rest of the body of the paper needs a first line indent. We kind of talked about this a little bit before. We can tab and put that tab and when we press enter, we're done with this paragraph. Is our indent still there? No. You have to remember to press tab at the end of every line. Our focus here, and this is gradable. This is something I can tell whether or not you did it, and I will grade you on it. Our intent is to use the indent. It's more efficient, and then every line will, of a new paragraph will automatically have it on. So this is gradable. Several ways to make it happen. How many of you use the buttons on your rulers to make it happen? A few, couple of you. Um, you could go to the Home tab, launch the Paragraph uh, Format dialog box, and then tell it to have an indent. Or right here on your ribbon, you could use these icons. I call them the hourglass. Looks like an hourglass. First triangle is pointing down, second triangle is pointing up, and there's a base underneath them. These are quiz questions. The top one, the, the triangle pointing down, affects only the first line of each paragraph. The one, the bottom one, the one pointing up, if you can move your mouse, it affects everything except the first line. The first line will hang out to the left margin or wherever you set it. Kind of like a numbered list. The numbers are out to the left, and then the, the rest of the paragraph is indented that quarter of inch. The bottom one, the base, the rectangle, 
affects the entire paragraph. Your reverse indent is the hanging indent. Your first line is hanging out to the left margin. Every other line underneath it is indented. And it doesn't have to stay all the way to the left margin. What's this gray stuff to the left of those, uh, the, the icons? Outside your margins. So it's showing you what your margin is. So sometimes I have people that turn in papers look something like this. And I'm like, oh, your indent, your hanging indent is out in your margins. You don't want that. We'll get to it. So it's easy enough to just click and drag what you want. We want the first line indent. And again, if you hold your mouse over it, you're going to get a hover, it's called. You will get a screen tip telling you what they do. Grab the one that says first line indent and move it in to the half inch line. How do you know which one's a half inch line? Well the numbers tell you an entire inch and we are dealing in inches not metrics and the dots between them are quarters. I get this wrong. No they're eighths. One two eighths equals a quarter, three eighths. Four, at your half inch you have a smaller, you have a line. The other ones between that are actually more like dots. So you can use this to figure out things where you want stuff um, Mathematically, sir. No, the question was very close. The question was, what do each one of these do? The the top one does only the first line. The bottom one does the reverse, the hanging indent. The base, the rectangle under it, moves the whole paragraph. Does not change margins actually changes period. If you want to change your margins, you can get a double-headed arrow. That literally changes your margins. And I don't recommend it because it doesn't easy to put it all back. But our hourglass with the base on it only does the individual paragraph we're in. If we had already typed it all, we would have selected all the paragraphs to make that happen. All right, so we need a first line indent. Why did we not put this in our style? Why didn't we update our style? Why? Because we had stuff above it that didn't need it. Let me show you case in point. Okay. What's the difference between these two lines? They're both center line paragraphs. I did a control E. And they're both center line paragraphs. They both have center alignments. When you use this first line indentation, it also adjusts where your center of your line is. So we don't want to accidentally forget and put this into our um, put this into our style that we'd have to go back and, do and take it off. We're going to work with that already. All right, let's get some text going in here. If you are here in the classroom or at somewhere at GRCC and have access to the H drive, you can get some text. Here we go. On the insert tab of your ribbon, over towards the right-hand side in the grouping called text, there is a command that says object. You want to click the drop-down arrow for that, and you want text from file. Then you want to go find the H drive, navigate to the H drive, the student. Navigate to our class inside of it, BA145. This time, instead of going to the data files for students, go to the Mrs. Tosma folder, into Word 2 folder, and here are three sets of uh, text for you. We are on page 84. Let's bring in the text from page 84. Here's what you want to be aware of. When it does that, did it take on my indentation, my paragraph? No. It just brought it right in as its own paragraph. What happens if I backspace? Oh, now it's all gone. What I'm going to do, 
I'm going to take my paragraph mark down here at the bottom on my file tab of the ribbon. Oh, and I didn't mean that. I don't want it backstage. On my home tab of the ribbon. I'm going to have this paragraph mark selected. Home tab of the ribbon, I'm going to click Format Painter. And then I'm going to click somewhere in my new paragraph that, I, that came in. So all the correction happened as you taught as you were typing. If you typed it directly in them and did what they asked and typed the word that incorrectly, when you press the space by or it automatically had changed it to the correct spelling. What we want to do is set up an autocorrect entry. So we're practicing the autocorrect feature of Word right now. And this will be your first picture. I'm going to pause the recording for questions in class. We are back. I know if you're watching the video, that was just only a hair's breadth. You didn't even have time to blink. But you could always pause the video whenever you wanted and come back to it. We're working on creating our own autocorrect entry and then showing me what you've done for that. So let's give it a try. On the file, we're going to go to our backstage view. On the left side, we want to click on options and go into the word options that we have. Brings up a dialog box. On this left hand side, we want to click on proofing. You can set options for what gets auto corrected and what does not. Writing style. In settings, you can have it check for whether or not you're using one or two spaces after spirit periods and make sure that you're doing so consistently. Some things I like to have in there. Autocorrect options, that's the button we want. Shows us a list of things that are going on. Auto format, auto format as you type, various actions, things that you can set up. So, for example, if I know I type, if I want to be lazy, I'd like to be lazy. I could say BT replace with the word Beth Ann, words Beth Ann Talsma and have it do an auto correction like that for me. Wouldn't that be nice? That's one way to do it. We're going to put a word in here now. Let's do computer a certain way, P T U E R. It's a common way to misspell it, C O M P T U E R. We want it auto-corrected to C-O-M-P-U-T-E-R. This is the picture that I'm asking that you give me. So let's press our darling little print screen button until we're happy with it. We click OK. We're done with the auto-correct box. <coughs> very important, very important. I had add. Very important. Um, I can't know how to spell. There it is. Yeah. Mine was okay. I would have done add if I wanted to do another one. Very important note. This is pertinent. This is individual per computer. So what you're doing right here in the classroom is not going to be on your home computer. What you're doing on your laptop at home will not be on your desktop at home. Will not be available when you come into the computer here. Make sense? This is only on this computer. So now we have it screenshot and we come to the bottom of our document here and we do paste. I'm doing control V for a short shortcut and it shows me that you are in here setting up an auto correction. Right in this document, you're uploading to, to Word on, to Blackboard only one document. There's no reason to waste paper by getting a whole second file. The only thing is, we just need to make sure we're above it when we're typing. It's okay that it's tiny. You don't have to resize it. I'm looking for certain things when I go into it. Basically, do you have the autocorrect dialog box over? And did you type the word computer two different ways in it? That's what I'm checking. You're showing me that you're practicing this concept and you're going to learn this skill. 
to be able to use it. All right, uh, we have more text to add in. We are on page 88, so let's go to the Insert tab on our ribbon. Back over to that command for object, click the drop down arrow and say text from file. Should take you to the same place you just went to get files. And now we want 88. Notice my cursor is still at the end of this paragraph. I'm hoping this text will come right in here. Let's see. It did. Finished off that paragraph. Yeah. But again, again, it took off my indent. I'm not going to fuss with this till we're done with the paper. I'm going to leave this alone. Seeing the writing on the wall, I'm just going to leave it alone and say, hey, we'll wait and happiness at the end. Take care of this at the end when I'm done. Insert. There's only one more thing to insert and then I'll do it all. The screenshot is underneath everything at the bottom. No. I said make sure when we type in we have our cursor above it. Mm -hmm. Right. The text that we inserted finished off that first paragraph and brought us in a second. We're at a point now where we're ready to put in our first citation and reference. So the first thing we need to do to be able to do this is tell Microsoft Word that we are using MLA style. We have a reference tab on the ribbon. That's where we're going to be working in this. Notice right now, directly underneath that is a command for style and it says APA. We are going to change that Let's go to MLA 7th edition. As far as I'm aware, that's the most recent edition. So that should be okay. Some of your instructors may still be using the 6th, and that's fine also. It all depends on what your... The question is, do most businesses do, are they using APA or MLA? It all depends. APA is more academic. It's from the uh, what American Psychology Association. MLA is a modern language, and businesses will be using that. You'll also see them using some other styles. The bottom line is you want to learn and figure out uh, differences between them. You want to know where to go, so whatever your business requires, or if they require nothing, well, I don't know, we don't have a format, you've got a place to start. That's what we want to do. So we set our, our references up to style to be MLA. We're putting that on there. Now, we should have a button over here. Under the insert citation, click that drop down arrow and we want to add a new source. Where's your cursor? We should be, I'm going to double check my cursors. We should be, be after computer but before the period. Press the space bar. We don't want the space bar to be part of our um, citation. We want the space bar to be out of it. So we should be, have a space bar in here ready to go. The question is, is there any way to change your insertion point once you've started adding in the new source? No, but you can move the source reference. You can, cut, you can cut and paste it there. We want to be aware of the different styles of references. Often we're using books, articles, websites. One thing we all have to individually learn and pay attention to against our style guide would be what pieces of information do we need based on what we're entering in. This dialog box right here, you could click this button and see all bibliography fields. It would be up to you. It always is up to you which one of these you fill in. You don't automatically fill in every single box. You have to look at the type of source you have and what it is you need. We're going to type in, if I can read this in the, in the uh, dim light of the classroom here, we want an article in a periodical. Give me an example of an article in a periodical. What, what could this be? Magazine. What's another thing a periodical could be? 
Newspaper. Absolutely. Those are your two most common. So if you have something out of a newspaper or something out of a magazine, you're looking at the type of source article in a periodical. We're going to type in directly what's in. The author is Rossi, comma, Marcel, Enrico. Notice there's no spelling or grammar check in here, so you have to do your own. The title, I'm pressing tab to get to the title, will be understanding how to use fingerprint readers. Pay attention to what you're capitalizing. Main words are initial caps. Things that are not main words in MLA style are um, prepositions. To, from, under, over. Depends. Usually anything that has less than four characters. Unless it's the beginning or ending of the title. In the case of this periodical, it's digital security review. I'm getting this information from page 90 in our textbook. The year it came out is 2014. It came out in August. MLA style uses an abbreviation, so it's AUG period. We don't know a day of the month that doesn't give us that, but we know a page where we found that. N dot space P A G dot. What in the world could that mean? There's no page given. Let's go with no page. Mm -hmm. Medium. What's medium? We don't mean a psychic. We're going to go see and find out uh, what our future is going to be where we found it. Was it in print? Was it on the web? And in this case, it is web. Capital W. So you're seeing that Microsoft provides you the boxes to fill in. You still need to refer to your reference guide to know what to capitalize, what to not capitalize, and how to write things. That's not what this class is about. I'm focusing on the fact that you are creating sources and electronically inserting them for this. Um, we also, we're not quite done. We need to show bib all bibliography fields because there's something else we need to go check out. We need to go down to, if you're doing, getting something on the web, you need to tell us when you got this from the web. So underneath, now we see a red star next to some words. Those are the recommended fields. And underneath web, we say year accessed, 2014. Your textbook is thinking futuristically. And it was done in October. Again, abbreviated. And the day of the month it was done is the third. So we type the three. What this will do for you is figure out where commas and parentheses and all that kind of, st kind of stuff go but it doesn't tell you what to type in the boxes. Again, refer to your MLA style reference guide for the, that information. That's our source. We clicked OK, I believe was it, and that type put it in right after our word computer. Now our period goes after that. So when I'm going through your documents and I click, it still did it. This is something I have noticed that drives me crazy. When I get onto a gray shading, it tells me it's a field code. It still wants to include that period, as, that space as part of the field code. I know it's not, and I'm not going to sit here and fuss over it 360 times for it to say, oh, no, don't worry about it. Um, I'm going to trust what I've done and leave it alone. There's always, there's always, there's a space between computer and the parenthesis of Rossi. The space is not supposed to be in the gray shaded meaning that the remember the gray shading means it's a computer code that word inserted all right I believe does that finish our paragraph we're gonna add more text um, 
Nope, there's more coming in. All right, last thing I have ready for us to insert. Don't forget to save. I just did a quick control S. Insert. Oops, I hit the wrong thing. I hit object and now I have the wrong document dialog box up. So I just hit cancel. Again, object, do the drop down arrow, text from file, page 91. Brought in this paragraph, external fingerprint readers. That is the last of our text to insert, helping us through this document. So now I know that I can set my first line paragraph indent confidently that I'm not going to have to mess around with it again. So I also notice that underneath that paragraph I now have two blank returns. One of them came in with my text, so I'm just going to delete that. I press backspace and had that go away. Underneath it, though, is the paragraph I like. It's got the indent on it. I'm going to hit on the Home tab of the ribbon. I'm going to hit this Format Painter. Now I'm going to click and drag all the way up just underneath my title. I'm going to affect all those at the same time. So I selected the paragraph I liked. I went to the Home tab of my ribbon. I clicked the Format Painter. This is a one-time button, unless you tell it to stay on forever. I clicked it once. Then I clicked in to, I selected all paragraphs up through until my title. And it applied that formatting all at once. So you see, inserting is a good thing. It also has its uh, issues. It's not perfect but it can be a fantastic little tool to use. If you haven't already, make sure you saved. Again, save as you go, save as you go, save as you go. Okay, this internal fingerprint reader stuff, this came out of information we have, so we need to put a footnote here. Uh, footnotes are used for explanatory information in addition to what's in your paper. And I'm going to pause a second for questions in the classroom. So we're back in the blink of an eye. Maybe you paused the video and took a break with us. Here we were inserting the reference mark is what we're doing. We're on page 92. Up on the references tab again. We needed to insert for us Not endnotes. What's the difference between an endnote and a footnote? Endnotes keep, you're absolutely correct, endnotes keep all the information together and then they paste it at the end of the document behind everything else. We're not doing that. We put them on each page as we're going along. So we're doing a footnote. Not to be confused with a footer. This is just a note at the bottom of this particular page. It stays with wherever this text. If I put in three paragraphs of text above this and it shoots to page two, that note will shoot to page two. That's another reason you want to do it through the automatic entry because it will move and adjust as needed. End notes are always at the end of it and there are certain styles for them, but not here in the MLA. So we're going to say we want to insert a footnote the computer automatically generates the number one and moves our cursor down into the footnote area. It's always still above your margin and it's uh, how much text fits on your page is based on whether or not where how much whether or not this can fit with the reference mark. It always stays with the reference mark. So here our text is at the top of page 93 Nadir and white state. That fingerprint, I can't do this. Readers can perform different functions for different fingers. For example, one finger runs a program and another finger shuts down the computer. And then the space bar. And oh my gosh, do I need to check on spelling. I think we're going to perform different and functions. So 
This line that's above it is called a continuation separator. You can never click it. Uh, you can affect it, but there's a long way, there's a different way to go about it. It's not easy to get to. And that's okay because we can just have it be right there. You get that sentence typed in. We do not press the period. We just press our space bar because we're going to insert a citation. We don't have all the information right now, but we know we need to put a citation here. So we click the insert citation button and we want to select the command that says add new placeholder. We're on the reference tab still. Insert citation and add a place. Our placeholder name, we're going to type this Nadir. So whenever we go put in our source information for Nadir, it will we'll come back and update this to the actual source it needs to be. And then don't forget your period to end your sentence. So using your computer can be this easy to help you put your research papers together. Now, what do you notice about this footnote? Does it look the same as our document text? The font is smaller. We can go over and check on the home tab of the ribbon and see that we're at Times New Roman 10 point. What's our spacing? It's only single point. Footnotes in MLA style need to look like the rest of the paper, which means double spaced, 12 point, and I will triple check myself, um, but I believe it's indented. Yes, looks absolutely like the body text. So, if you notice, up on the home tab of your ribbon, normal is not selected. So what is? I'm clicking the drop down arrow from the more gallery on styles. I don't see anything there. Well, if I right click in my footnote, I have a command for style. I click that and it pops up the style dialog box and tells me I'm in the footnote text style. We are going to change the style, again, using our computer efficiently, we want to change the style of our footnote so that when we add a second one in, it automatically goes to this format. We don't have to worry about it anymore. What we want to change is Um, first of all, we click on Modify, and it's based on Normal. We change our font to 12. Now, under the Format button, I'm going to go to Paragraph. Notice. Underneath where I had the style and stuff, I have buttons for left, center, right alignment. I also have a single double, double spacing, indents. I'm not always confident what those are going on. I'm simply going to go to the paragraph dialog box. This is what we're used to. Line spacing, I'm going to put it double. Indentation, I will put it first line, half an inch. So you could use the icons out there in the dialog box, or you could do it through the all right I'm gonna click OK finish out this dialog box and apply or close this dialog box you can see our footnote changed I'm gonna pause the video for some questions in the classroom so that was inserting a placeholder now later on we come back and we have the information so we're ready to update it and put all the correct information in. So in this case, let's click in it, somewhere in the deer, up on our references tab of the ribbon. Uh, 
actually you don't even have to go there you can just click this options button and say we want to edit source we're ready we have all the information here's where we tell it this one's actually a book so now we're ready to fill in the pieces of information pieces of information are found on page 97 and 98 so uh, authors we need to our author is a little bit different so we're gonna edit and we're gonna actually add in our author's name this way this time so Nadir is the first I'm sorry is the last name we have more than one author that's what's going on here Aisha is the first name of this person and Sadie S-A-T-I is the is the middle name our second author you hit the add button and now we fill in our second author It's white Jonathan Richard this is how you would enter information when you have more than one author or something interesting is going on the way they write their name you want to be very uh, particular about how it is specified so now we can click the OK button and your author should come up Nadir comma Aisha Sadie semicolon white comma Jonathan Richard semicolon remember you have to crack your own type in, in here the title of this is biometric security the year is 2014 it's out of Chicago from the Windy City Press and this is in print we did not get this online this is a book and so we click OK now our citation changed to say Nadir and white again we want to change some options on it so we click the options drop down arrow and we say edit citation we got this out of pages 62 and 63 so we put those in there we list them in there now that's all we need to show at this point because we already started our footnote with the weird nadir and white state with that phrase we don't have to repeat their name in the citation so instead let's click the author button and title and say those go away and we just click OK all that we have to list here is the page numbers again this is how you can do this electronically without having to type that in yourself and keep track of where it's at there is more text to be entered at this point page 100 we're gonna finish off Oh, we're not going to finish off. We're going to we're going to type in this paragraph yet. Um, so if I'm going to pause the video so that you don't have to watch me type. The question is, where do we type our new paragraph? We were probably had your cursors in your in your footnote. I made sure that my cursor was after the number one. Fingerprint readers are number one reference mark. I pressed enter to start a new paragraph. okay we typed in these couple of sentences ending in the word public now at this point for no random reason that I can understand your book says let's stop pause a second and see if we match up at this point right now we're gonna check the word count see where we're at this is what you're gonna take a picture of to show me that uh, you matched up to this point Does that make sense so correct the pages and lines will be off because of the screen print but your word count should be very very close if not absolutely perfect especially if you're following what I've been doing um, the way to get to your word count over your lower left hand side of your taskbar 
tells you how many words you've got. You click that and it pops up your entire document. Make sure it says includes text boxes, footnotes, and endnotes. Make sure there's a check mark there. We should have 214 words, 1,211 characters without spaces, 14, 17 width. Ooh, I have three characters wrong. What could have I done with three characters? This is the picture we want. So get that print screen going. Print screen, that button. Close the dialog box because you can't do anything else. Close the dialog box. Go down under our other picture and paste it down there. So here's the thing. This is the five-point project. Although it is extremely interesting, I am not going to fuss over it. Remember the five-point project, we don't lose anything. Let's see if I can do... This is... Yeah, this one I can't tell at the end. We'll see at the end. I have a sneaking suspicion of something, but it doesn't... I don't see it here. Lower left-hand side of your taskbar. Make sure you paste this picture. What? Yeah, there's probably one. Got it? Found it? There we are. I'm focusing on you can show me the word count. In a bit, you will worry about the actual number of words. You have extra lines because of our pictures, and you may have, the extra, you may have extra blank returns underneath it. Go down to your bottom and see if there's any blank returns to delete. Okay. Bottom line, make sure that you insert that picture, paste it in. Go back. We're staying with, type, with typing. We've only got a little bit of class time left here. We want to finish this up if we can today. The question has come up. The question has come up, what's going on that mine wants to go on to another page? I would encourage you to figure a few things out. If it wants to go on another page already, before I get any further, um, it could be that there's something going on up above you have extra. Maybe your spacing is different. Maybe you have left on that space after paragraph and there's a big space between every paragraph and it's affecting how many words fit on here. We need to bring in the remainder of the third paragraph. Your book on page 101 talks about the citation and a placeholder. I'm sorry, it's talking about the automatic page breaks. Word will adjust automatic. Note the word automatic. I'm sure it's on your quiz. Automatic page breaks, it will adjust it and um, for however many words fit on a page according to your printer and your margins, those kind of things. Later on we're going to insert a manual page break and that will not. The automatic is also called a soft. You may have heard of that. Happens in the background. It's not something that you have to worry about as you go. It's just automatic. Back in the day when they first started this, you used to have to hit a button and tell it to actually repaginate. Not anymore. Just flowing as we go. So let's bring in the last of our paragraph. Should have a file out there available to you for page 101 text. Word also does window orphan control so we'll always make sure at least two lines move to the next page of a paragraph always have to have two together here we're going to put in a tag a placeholder so we want to insert citation and say come on do it add a new placeholder and the placeholder for this one is Alan Smith Your book also wants you to be aware that uh, you could actually not show this white space above your page if you didn't want to. It'd be entirely up to you. We've all probably done it accidentally. All of a sudden, you've done something and whoa, all your text is run next to each other. Where's, where's my stuff? It's because you had this two-headed arrow and you accidentally double-clicked and therefore your margin went away. All you have to do is double-click to get it back. So we come back later. We're all happy. We have the Alan Smith information now. I am killing you. I don't mean to. Oh, your computer is? The text. 
Mm -hmm. So, um, just a second here. I'm going to pause this. We're going to finish the lesson in a separate video, so I am closing this off here on page um, 102, I think. We have to edit the sort. We're headed into 103.